coming and thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm supposed to talk to you, I don't know, new models to measure performance. At least that's what was on the agenda. In the case, in the situation of positive economy, and from what I understand, positive economy is at the heart of this uh, definition, is long term. And so for the future generations. And so this term should be used not in rhetorical terms, but concretely so. Because I have some good news for you. The future generations are among us. And being among us, we must already deal with them. And not simply give up whatever we could do today to increase their uh, well-being. When parents are unemployed, uh, the children's education will uh, suffer from that. When difficulties arise in families, future generations are, partial, are in part sacrificed. When youth unemployment rates reach huge uh, levels, the future uh, human capital is what is being then destroyed. And so with others, and, uh, uh, and particularly Joseph Stiglitz, uh, we have implemented new systems that would allow us to envisage, to think through what the present is about, what the future is about, because what we measure now has an impact on what we do. In fact, it determines what we do. And so, measurement systems or the metrics that we used are to a lack in, par in impartiality. They're, they are biased. And so, biased, too biased, and don't take into account what is difficult for populations. And so everybody here seemed to um, accuse the GDP. P uh, GDP uh, is nothing uh, as such. It's just uh, an intellectual construction connecting or drawn from national accounting, which helped us immensely. But at the beginning, GDP had always been designed to measure merchant activities, but it's because we are using it for other um, aims that people are now criticizing it. GDP in itself is not data as such. Let me use an example for you to show you already uh, the lackings, the shortcomings of our systems. Uh, when we say that GDP growth is 3%, Per annum, I know, I know. Uh, nowadays, this is a dream. But let's say that uh, the growth of the GDP would be 3% per annum. So the issue is to determine if all of the population uh, draws from this growth. Or is this growth spread in such a way that it is not evenly spread throughout the populations? And it so happens that over the past two or three decades, inequalities have increased immensely so, since GDP is in fact an average. When you look at the growth of inequalities, uh, and at that time when there is growth of inequalities, nobody can uh, find themselves uh, in line with the GDP, which means that the GDP does not correspond to the majority of populations. What would be important would be to add to this uh, growth metric uh, of GDP another measure, which would then divide the population in two equal parts, those who make over 50% more 
than the median or the uh, level or 50% less. Then you can have a huge growth without median moving whatsoever. If the richer 50% uh, see their income double, the growth will be wonderful. If the 10% richest see fourfold increases in their revenues, growth will be huge. But 80% of the population won't have seen anything. But what is important, if you look at our measurement systems, what is important for the economic policies is what happens with the majority of, of the people, the majority, the average population, not the uh, level of the population, which is the top of the pyramid. The 20% uh, most rich in the United States reach 24% of the GDP, which is something uh, huge, incredible. But this can only bring out the fact that 80% of the population for 75% uh, of the century, their uh, revenue uh, remain stable. And so that particular part or share of the population will not be interested uh, in any wonderful statements on the uh, great growth of the GDP. This shows that even as a measurement to measure economic activities, GDP does not suffice to actually reflect correctly what the population is all about. And there is a split between publications by the public uh, statistics institutes and what the population actually perceives as real. A second example, it is uh, public production or production by the government. We don't know. We don't know how to measure uh, mm, central or public production. National production is measured by inputs, in other words, by expenditures, health expenditures, education expenditure. But what is important is the production of education, the production of health. We can be the country spending the most for education, and at the same time, the country that would see the quality of their students uh, remain completely stable with no growth. Look, the country that spends the most money, and therefore the production is considered as the major one in terms of health, and that is the United States. They, de they spend 15% of their GDP in health matters. And I would say now it's even 16%. And in France, 11%. Now, tell me, how about this production? Health production is higher in the United States than in France? Well. We could challenge that statement. We could challenge that. Oh, suffice it to uh, see that uh, the people who have health difficulties uh, live in terrible conditions when they are not in the right uh, wealth bracket in the United States. And so the um, US GDP will have four points above uh, the French, 15 minus 11, whereas in fact, it ought to be lower to the French GDP, at least in terms of health production. A second example, when a private company is nationalized, do you know what happens? <laughs> the GDP drops. Even if the production of this company doesn't change in any way, it's simply because the uh, profit share disappears. And therefore, 
the profit component of the GDP is reduced. And so the economy experts is developing or they are developing their thoughts on the basis of a statistic artifact looking at the country that have the higher expenditures are those where the uh, economic performances are the lower ones lowest ones this is wrong because you work on the basis that public production doesn't draw from any growth positive growth in productivity and I could go on talking to you about the GDP but as I told you at the onset the GDP is only a metric uh, for uh, productivity it's the well-being of populations that we need to look at and so some policies have as an impact to make you believe in the GDP but in fact bring down well-being there are different ways of looking at this. The objective approach and the uh, subjective approach. The subjective ones have shown that well-being in all countries where these studies uh, was uh, studied, well, what came out was the cost of unemployment is far higher than the loss of revenue for the people unemployed, which means that fluctuations of well-being are stronger than the GDP fluctuations. Without growth uh, of the GDP, wellness crumbles because of the cost of unemployment. As an objective for economic policy, it would be better to work on the stabilization of employment rather than a greater GDP, because in that way, collective well-being, wellness, could then uh, increase. But you're familiar with health. Health is a major determining factor to take into account, and it can be measured with some very uh, in fine indicators in terms of expenditures, you can determine what becomes of the populations and then look at education. That's also one of the uh, basic components of well-being. And then the production of education is easy to measure. And then economic safety is also to take into account because it's one of the essential components of well well-being because it helps people enjoy life without economic safety the situation is a, a very difficult one other aspects need to be taken into account the environment but not environment in terms of uh, planet survival no but the damage of evolution nowadays is the population doesn't like to have uh, asthmatic children, suffer children suffering from asthma or noise. Uh, people like clean cities. When cities get dirty, populations are uh, feeling comfortable about that. And then there's physical safety or violence. That's also a phenomenon that destroys well-being and uh, even if it increases the GDP it increases GDP because the result is that families buy more alarms more bodyguards and so forth look at the gated communities you find them everywhere in the world all these elements could bring up the GDP and bring down the wellness. The phasing out of uh, unemployment subsidies would then lead to an increase in uh, employment, but it would be job insecurity and such insecurity 
that the drop in well-being due to this measure would not be acceptable for the population. And then there are measurement systems that allow us to look at sustainability. And let me take a very clear example today. Europeans are looking at the sustainability of the public debt. And the Europeans are destroying. And due to that, they destroy the economic system. It means that for the following period, a capital will be delivered at least equal to the one that we drew from. That is debt sustainability, public debt sustainability. It's both human capital, social capital, physical capital, natural capital. If bringing down the public uh, debt means that these types of capitals will be brought down also, then this means that the consequence will be bringing down the sustainability of the system. But it so happens that the experience that we are living in Europe nowadays allows us to uh, draw a lot of teachings from them. And the policy of uh, reduction has destroyed a lot of human um, situa capacity. There is a connection between the increase of unemployment and long-term unemployment. It means that part of the population is not included, and the social capital also. To be excluded from the productive system leads, obviously, to a loss of connections and of social capital. But it also destroys some physical capital because the crisis was the result of an excessive private debt. It means that companies and households must get rid of their debts. And if at the same time, the state uh, is not and uh, getting rid of its own debt, then households are not getting rid of their own debts either. And more companies will then become redundant or be led to bankruptcy far more than if the policy had been, or the politicians, had been ready to accommodate more. It also destroys public physical capital. For instance, in the program that the Troika imposed to Greece, in that program, there was this need for Greece to sell some of their public assets. But sell public assets at that stage in time, I'm sorry about my cold, I apologize. That means that, in fact, you are putting them on the market at you're letting them go cheap, so you're decreasing the debt, but you're decreasing even more so the proportion of physical public assets, and so you lose. And there's a consequence on the environment, because in a policy Look at all, in the time of restrictions, look at these budget. And uh, everybody brings down their budgets and there's no investment in environment or in new uh, energies. I had suggested 10 years ago that we create a European community for the energy, environment and research so that it would be possible to invest for the future, 
in what will then lead to the well-being of future and happiness of the future populations. But Europe became minimalist, creating wonderful objectives. We're the most intelligent, the Lisbon program, as long as they don't cost a penny to be drawn from the budget. To have uh, economies that would use as little energy as possible, the 2020-20 European program. Why is that impossible? Because there are no instruments. And if you have a policy and no instruments, you'll never reach your objective. If you had metrics, well-being, and sustainability, then the politicians would modify their policies because their objective, after all, is to be elected. And then one more thing, just to close. The one that worries me most is the destruction of democratic capital, which is the major intangible asset due to uh, these policies. If a great part of the population suffers from uh, this, well, the system is going to have to change. And what you see now in Europe and elsewhere is the increase in uh, extreme positions, uh, nationalization, national positions. If you want to reduce the scope of a state, is connected to all of this and to this loss in democracy. Thank you very much.